Poetry gives us something else, right? Um, it gives us something else, it asks something else of us in return. Poetry asks us to listen, right, to taste, to see, to think, and ultimately, and perhaps its most important demand and gift, is that it asks us to empathize. And what's the quality of empathy? You put yourself in the shoes of the other person. Brian Turner's poems ask us to embody the grandmother in Mosul, in the market, who witnesses her grandchild dying. Um, he asks us to feel the soldier who's being ripped apart by shrapnel. He tells us in his poetry to try, try to feel the sensation, to try to feel the loss. So what poetry asks of us, obviously, is a, is a working with language that many of us aren't often familiar with, but the return is incredible because, you know, the payback is that deeper sense of feeling, tasting, emotion that reports and even memoirs can't quite give us. So I hope you'll listen with that extra attention to this amazing poet. Um, Brian's originally from California. He earned an MFA, Master of um, Fine Arts in Creative Writing from the University of Oregon before serving for seven years in the U.S. Army. He was an infantry team leader for a year in Iraq with the 3rd Striker Brigade Combat Team, 2nd Infantry D Division. Say that part of the Prior to that, he deployed to Bosnia and Herzegovina with the 10th Mountain Division. His other occupations, he's been a machinist, a locksmith's assistant, assistant, convenience store clerk, a pickler, a maker of circuit boards, a dishwasher, an EFL teacher in South Korea. People teach English um, over there low-voltage electrician, radio DJ, bass guitar instructor, and more. And I guess I tell you all of that, uh, he's got a publication list and an honors list a mile long. I think it's important to know that all writers have these diverse lives. Um, he didn't sit on the mountaintop and write poetry since he was eight, right? So poetry comes from everywhere. That should be an encouragement to all of you who are doing all these different jobs and maybe thinking about poetry. So. Um, just want you to know his books are on sale in the back. He's got a, a memoir, a recently published memoir, My Life as a Foreign Country, a memoir, and it's been called Achingly, Disturbingly, and Shockingly Beautiful. So if you're interested in reading his story, I strongly suggest you consider buying the book. Um, he'll read from his poetry also, Hear Bullet, that I referenced before, and uh, I just hope you'll enjoy him as much as I know I will. It's my pleasure to welcome Brian Turner. body is what you want, then here is bone and gristle and flesh. Here is the clavicle snapped wish, the aorta's open vowels, the leap thought makes at the synaptic gap. Here is the adrenaline rush you crave, that inexorable flight, that insane puncture into heat and blood. And I dare you to finish what you've started, because here, bullet, here is where I complete the word you bring hissing through the air. Here is where I moan the barrel's cold esophagus, triggering my tongue's explosives for the rifling I have inside of me, each twist of the round spun deeper, because here, bullet, here is where the world ends, every time. You guys are probably like, what is that all about? <laughs> I, I don't know if you are, I, I kind of am. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I wrote that poem, I wasn't going to read it actually until you started talking, and then, but I wrote that poem, it's a signature poem in the book, it's unlike most of the others, it's one of the very few that sort of turns inward, um, I believe much more of a personal poem. I wrote it about, I was in Iraq from 2003 to 2004. Uh, we were based out of Fort Lewis, Washington, just south of Seattle. And um, I wrote it in about 12 to 15 minutes. I, I had two or three lines off to the side that I quickly excised and it's verbatim what it was. The word um, complete was originally finished. I changed that word. Um, and then I folded it up, put it in a Ziploc bag and carried it in my breast pocket the rest of the time that I was in country. Um, so it's so any psychology majors afterwards, we can meet and get some cookies and talk. Um, <laughs> but part of the reason I share this is because when you're talking about this idea of poetry, um, when I was, I went to Fresno City College, and then I went to Fresno State in Central Valley, California. And um, I was in a band, I had hair halfway down my back, played bass guitar, pretty cool bass playing just a few minutes ago. And um, I, I took some poetry classes, not because I really particularly liked poetry, I kind of 
I actually was repelled by most of the stuff I'd ever come across. And um, I was, it just wasn't drawn to it. That's, that's maybe a better way of putting it. And uh, I thought maybe poetry classes would help. I, that's much better. Yeah, cool, thank you. <laughs> this guy's a genius back here. He's running the show. Um, but I, I took a couple poetry classes thinking that it would help me to write better lyrics for the band I was in so we could like tour Japan and go to Europe and stuff. And that never quite panned out. Um, Afterwards, though, after this is finished, if you're, if you're interested, please ask me. I have a postcard that has a, a scan code and a, and a hyperlink to one of the songs of the band that I used to play in. And I especially like to share that, and it's one of the reasons I love to be able to meet people, is because the guitarist is my friend since I was about seven, we're really like brothers. And he passed away from stomach cancer last, uh, well, December of uh, 2012, actually. So uh, in some small way, this is a chance for me to help him still be with us. You can hear his work. You hear me on the bass. Backing vocals is a very fancy term for what I was doing. You know? <laughs> but you can hear a song. Um, when I was taking a couple of those poetry classes, I remember walking across campus, I had my backpack on. I remember in particular, it was, a night, it was nighttime, sprinklers were on, and the, um, there were some light, you know, street lights and stuff at the, on the Fresno State campus. And um, this other poet who also passed away, sadly, very young, named uh, Andres Montoya, he came up. He wrote a book called the Ice Worker Sings and Other Poems. And he shoved this poem in my hand from this poet that taught on campus who's like some famous poet guy. I, I'd never heard of him. I mean, I'd heard of him, but I didn't, I didn't know his work. You know, he had a National Book Award. He later became the poet laureate of the United States. Um, he shoved this poem in my hand, and, and I read it, and it was just this bizarre language, maybe a little bit like that poem I just read that you might have heard. Um, <clears throat> that poem starts, it's called They Feed, They Lion by Philip Levine. I won't read the whole poem, but I'll share it, but I'll part of it. Out of burlap sacks, out of bearing butter, out of black bean and wet slate bread, out of the acids of rage, the candor of tar, out of creosote, gasoline, drive shafts, wooden dollies, they lie and grow. Right? If a body is what you want, then here is bone and gristle and flesh. Here is the clavicle snapped wish, the aorta's open valves, the leap thought makes at the synaptic gap. Here is the adrenaline rush you crave. So I, I told people for a couple of years that I'd written that my poem in like 12 to 15 minutes, listening to Queens of Stone Age is kind of like background music or you know, wallpaper sound. But really, I've been working on that poem for years. You know? And for those of you who memorize a poem or you, you maybe spend a lot of time with a poem, because um, it intrigues you or interests you, if you end up writing a poem that mimics it, that's good practice. That's how you learn to play instruments. You know, by practicing scales and learning songs that others have made. And then at some point, maybe you'll find yourself in a difficult point in your life like I was in Iraq. And when I needed to like write in my journals and try to figure out something that was beyond the space of Sergeant Turner, because I don't know how it is for you, but like when I was, say when I was in uniform, my, my name was stripped away. I only had a warrior's name, Sergeant Turner. It was a much smaller version of myself but I had notebooks when we got back to our hooches and I would write in my journals. And that's the space where the landscape of my imagination could be a larger version of myself. And a poem like this, I could lean on Philip Levine's music and write my own poem and think about the world in a way I needed to. Is that useful in any way? How are you guys doing today? You doing all right? It's lunchtime. Is anybody like sort of incarcerated here? By, by that I mean you're here, you have to you know, like, sign in somewhere for a class or something. Um, <clears throat> um, if you, if it's helpful, I'll read for a while and then um, and talk in between the poems. Uh, but uh, at the end, maybe we can have more of a conversation. So if you have a quiz or anything or something, you gotta write for a paper, let me know the question. I might be able to give you a little intel. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. While I'm looking for this next poem, how about I'll give you my phone number? Let's see you guys get yourself uh, ready. What's your name? Tyrell. Tyrell, you're ready, man. So let me give you my phone number, okay? Uh, it's 407. Area code 407. <laughs> I'm from Orlando, Florida. Yeah. 864 2586. Did you guys all get that? You ready? Because well, I'm hoping what you do is maybe you can text me and be like, well, that poem sucked. That one's a little better. You know, keep, keep trying I'll give like that. Water. What's that? I'll give you some water. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, for everybody else who didn't catch it, 407 864 2586. If you text me today or like now or in the next couple hours or so, I'll try to respond to you in the next 24 hours. I'll do my best, you know. Um, but if, you, if it's later down the road, I probably can't, because we all have busy lives. And I, you know. 
I'm in the word now right now. That's what I'm trying to do to be here. The idea really though is to plant a seed. And that is that you, surely you'll lose the number along the way or run out and who the hell is this guy? The race from the, you know, from your address book. But um, years from now maybe, you'll find a way perhaps to help Iraq or Afghan veterans, for example, as they make their way home and their families. And maybe you have some organization or some good project that might be very useful in helping them reintegrate into, the, into the, our larger community. I'd be very interested in helping you. And to be honest, I'd be even more interested if you find some way to help perhaps Iraq or Afghan, um, maybe the newest of Americans coming here, like the interpreters that we don't invite here, those empty seats where the dead reside now. Like in my, my unit, when we left in 2004, this is long before now, right? 2004, when we left, our brigade went home just before Halloween of 2004. And 12 of the interpreters that worked with us had their heads cut off. So, do you, you realize that, um, I'm gonna drift here for a second, but since, um, since the start of the war in Iraq, there was a quota of 1,200 slots available for Iraqi or Afghan people to come to the United States. Or no, just for Iraqi people to come to the United States. We never made the quota until the, um, the election of 2008. We made it in that particular year during the election year. And have a sense. There's a small town, I went there in Sweden. I went there specifically to talk to the city council and perhaps the mayor. Because that mayor, south of Soder, um, uh, Stockholm, a small town called Södertalje, he came to the United States Congress. And he said, my town has 60, about 60,000 people. But it has ballooned out to 72,000. We have 12,000 Iraqi refugees in this one small town, right? Um, imagine that if one in seven people, roughly, was, a, was an Iraqi citizen, refugee from a war. Um, and he said, can you help us? And he went home, of course, he went home empty-handed. Um, you know, hey, thanks, nice to meet you. It's really tough what you have to do. But in fact, his town, just his town, had taken in far more ref of these Iraqi people fleeing the war than our entire country has it up to this point. So, are we going to attend to the responsibilities that we begin? Um, I'll share a poem that's not my own. Actually, is that okay? Is that right? Sally, I'm gonna ask my boss if that's all right. Yeah. Is that okay if I read somebody else's poem? It's a good poem, I promise. This is by, um, <clears throat> it's by Yehuda Amakai. It's called The Diameter of the Bomb. The diameter of the bomb was 30 centimeters, and the diameter of its effective range about seven meters, with four dead and 11 wounded. And around these, in a larger circle of pain and time, two hospitals are scattered in one graveyard. But the young woman, who was buried in the city she came from, at a distance of more than 100 kilometers, enlarges the circle considerably. And the solitary man mourning her death on the distant shores of a country far across the sea includes the entire world in the circle. And I won't even mention the howling of orphans that rises up to the throne of God and beyond, making a circle with no end and no God. That's Yehuda Amakai. So if you're texting, you know, give a shout out for Yehuda. You know, he's just a really good, fine poet. Uh, he's gone now, but we have the poems to, to know him through. Um, I, I really, that poem is important to me because I, today I'm specifically talking about war and trauma, uh, trauma but oftentimes um, there are many different types of trauma or difficult events in our lives, and there's oftentimes a sort of locus, focus, this is like focus point, right? Or locus, loci, I never know what the right word in math is, but that central emanating place where something happened, or there was a moment where something traumatic happened. And then for the rest of our lives, oftentimes, the reverberations sound themselves out in different ways through the rest of our days. And how do we find a way to carry that difficult time with us and integrate it within our experience in our lives as we move forward so that we might lead healthy, perhaps happy lives? That's one of my big questions. You guys doing all right? Yeah? I'm terrible at reading faces. I'm looking at you and I'm like, okay, who have I put asleep here? Who made it wake up, man? I need a lady back there. And there's a lady in the very back keeps closing her eyes when I read poems. I really love that because you're trying to hear the music. And I'm with you. It's cool. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was living in, I live in Orlando now, but I used to live in Fresno when I came back from the war. 
and um, I went I went into Lowe's Home Improvement Center. I need to get some nails. You know, just a simple thing. I was building some in the backyard. You know? So I go in there, but it's not like going to your mom and pop hardware store. Lowe's has like a grocery store, a big American style. You know, like 50 feet of nails. <laughs> you know, over my head, rows. You know, and you got to find the kind of nail you're looking for. And I, I found the wrong one. They're these double-headed nails. He often used for like scaffolding and stuff, right? But as I looked at them, I realized it looked a lot like the firing pin that went into my M4, the, the carbine that I used to carry. The firing pin is what hits, it, it strikes the primer, it creates a small explosion which sends the bullet out into the world. Right? And um, as I realized that, I mean, I could have just thought, well, that's pretty bizarre, just that recognition, you know, sort of an imagistic rhyme. Not a sound rhyme, but an image rhyme. So I went back out to my car, got my notebook, because I realized a poem was announcing itself. And obviously I had a little free time. You know? <laughs> so I, I got that, I came back in, started taking notes and looking around this Lowe's Home Improvement Center, looking for the rest of the poem or whatever other imagistic rhymes might in language too, I was looking for language. And um, this guy walked up to me, because I must have looked like I knew what it was, something like I knew how to do stuff. You know, he's like, so when you're working with building plaster, how do you, I was like, well, you know, I'm a poet, you know? <laughs> he looked at me like, like I was a grapefruit or something, you know, like, what? <laughs> I did not expect that, you know. But this poem comes from that, ex that experience. It's called At Lowe's Home Improvement Center. Standing on aisle 16, the hammer and anchor aisle, I bust a 50-pound box of double-headed nails open by accident. They're oily bright shanks and diamond points like firing pins from M4s and M16s. In a steady stream, they pour under the tile floor, constant as shells falling south of Baghdad last night, where Bosch kneeled into the chain guns of helicopters stationed above, their tracer fire a synaptic geometry of light. At dawn, when the shelling stops, hundreds of bandages will not be enough. I interject to say, that's from an email that he was sending to me. And he said, you know, at dawn, and he said, well, among the American side, not a scratch. And yet on that side, hundreds of bandages were not enough. Bosch walks down aisle 16 now, in full combat gear, improbable, worn out from fatigue, a rifle slung at his side, his left hand guiding a 10-year-old boy who has seen what war is and will never rid it from his head. Here, Bosch says, take care of him, I'm going back in for more. Sheets of plywood drop with the airy breath of mortars the moment they crack open in shrapnel. Mower blades are just mower blades, and the Troy-built self-propelled mower doesn't resemble a Blackhawk or an Apache. In fact, no one seems to notice the Casualty Collection Center Doc High marks out in ceiling fans, aisle 15. Wounded Iraqis with IVs sit propped against boxes as 92 sample Paradiso fans hover in a slow revolution of blades. The forklift driver over-adjusts, swinging the tines until they slice open gallons and gallons of paint. Sienna dust and lemon sorbet and ship's harbor blue pulling in the aisle where Sergeant Rampley walks through, carrying someone's blown off arm, cradled like an infant, handing it to me, saying, hold this, Turner, we might find who it belongs to. Cash registers open and slide shut with the sound of machine guns being charged. Dead soldiers are laid out at the registers on the conveyor belts, and people in line still reach for their wallets. Should I stand at the magazine rack reading Landscaping with Stone or the complete, complete Home Improvement Repair Book? What difference does it make if I choose tumbled travertine tile, baratino marble, or absolute granite? Outside, palm trees line the asphalt boulevards. Restaurants cool their patrons who will enjoy fireworks exploding over Bass Lake in July. But inside, aisle number seven is a corridor of lights. Each dead Iraqi walks amazed by Tiffany posts and Bavarian pole lights. Motion-activated incandescents switch on as they pass by, reverent sentinels of light welcoming them to Lowe's Home Improvement Center, aisle number seven, where I stand in mute shock, someone's arm cradled in my own, the Iraqi boy beside me reaching down to slide his fingertip in, fingertip in retro-colonial blue and interior latex before writing T for tourniquet on my forehead. Could we be bleeding and we don't even know it? Let me ask you a question. Um, I just got this. I, I was going to get a mocha frappuccino. And I, I thought, you know, venti was a little too much, you know. And I had to watch the weight and gain way too much weight, you know. So I thought, oh, grande, okay. No whipped cream, though, you know. Uh, but let's not just 
Pepper, do you have a peppermint mocha frappuccino? Yes. Fantastic. Let me have one of those. That's what I got. Just down the road, you know. It's delicious. Um, and it's obscene. Because I can, I can, I can drink that, and yet I'm, and I can walk about my day. I can take pictures of the campus, which I did. I thought, oh, that's beautiful. I did from the road, but I can get a ticket for this. But I want to take a picture of this campus, right where it says, you know, the name of the school. I saw the trees and how beautiful it was. And in Florida, we don't have this kind of fall. And so it's really trying to take in this sort of sweep of color that you, you enjoy here. And it's obscene. Because I knew I'd drive in. I didn't know I'd hear beautiful jazz music. Amazing. It's obscene. I live in a country so wealthy, you can wage wars and not even think about them. I live in a country, I live a life that's so wealthy, I, I can wage war and not even think about it. We are dropping bombs on people right now. Those of you laughing and talking to each other there, you're part of helping to kill people in a country far across the sea. Where are you? You know? Is that the world you live in? How old were you guys, like, um, the lady right there, you have, like, a little bit of pink? Yeah, I'm sorry. But how old were you? If you don't mind me asking, what year were you born in? 96. 96? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. You also? Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, you both do. You're right. No, you're totally right. Well, but what year were you born in? 94. 94, 96. Anybody 93? 92? You got a couple in 92, right? How about this? This is a weird thing. I'm sure you've thought about this before, right? you probably thought... I've never done this one simple thing, not once in my entire life, this simple thing. I've never done that that wasn't in a time of war. I live in a country that's waged war in my entire life. I've never taken a breath, if you're, if you're an American, without being at war. And I don't even have to think about it. Let's talk about wealthy. Oh, let's talk about obscenities. That's an obscenity. How many people have we lost in the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan? Usually, sort of compress them together. You know, this isn't a math test, so if you can get tight clubs, what numbers have you heard? You guys talking connected? Is this, is it okay? <laughs> I know it's a little awkward. Five thousand. What's that? Five thousand. Five thousand, right? That's some people might say six thousand, maybe. What if I ask the same question but with like a different inflection on the same words? Like, how many have we lost? A different number? Yeah. Too many. Too many. Okay. What if I said a different inflection with the same words? How many have we lost? Like, like who is we? Right? I guess what I'm saying is, like, we, when I drive home, I live in Florida now. We went to see, my wife bought me um, keys, and we went up to watch uh, our tickets to see the black keys up in, in um, uh, the Flaming Lips up at, uh, in Atlanta. So we drove from Orlando to Atlanta. And when you get to the Florida-Georgia border, there's a border, there's a big sign that says, welcome to Georgia. If you go look the other way, it says, welcome to Florida, you know, right? Like most states. And then um, we could stop, pull over, get out. I could get on my smartphone, boom, map quest it. And I can see the line, it's right there. I could even, maybe even put my one leg on one side and one on the other of this imagine this visual line I can see on the phone, but I look on the ground, it's not there, you know what I mean? Um, that kind of thinking, if we can have this kind of thinking to realize that we, uh, that you could cross over oceans and seas and over you know, countries with millions of people going about their lives, and you could land in a place like Kabul or, you know, or Kirkuk or Mosul or Baghdad, there's so many of these places, um, millions of people, and they share the oxygen of our time. There's an there's a estimate from the former Bush administration, which was that, as they were leaving, I believe 30,000 was what the official number was at that time before before leaving office. Um, there's another estimate that says somewhere around 490,000. That's from the Lancet survey, which is a British university and American university coming together, um, knowing that the difficulty, knowing like say a bomb went off like right down in the next building over, and somebody had a heart attack and died. You don't know if they were going to have a heart attack anyways or if they had it because of that. You know what I mean? Some people went missing, they're presumed dead, so the numbers, I think their numbers are actually somewhere between 490,000 and 720,000, somewhere in that range. They have a range for their, for their survey. There's another estimate that says 1.2 million people. 
that includes the first Gulf War, uh, the current wars, and in between, like the infant mortality rate because of what we call sanctions. This is where I'm circling back. I'm gonna read a poem in just a second, but um, when I say you haven't taken a breath, because you probably think, well, wait a minute, there was the first Gulf War 91, then 2001 went to Afghanistan, 2003 went to Iraq, and been there since, right? But there probably seems like a gap there where if you were born in 94, 96, like the two of you were, um, actually, I would say, if, if we call them sanctions in Iraq, but if you had over Connecticut Iraqi jets flying, and now and then bombing what they would call an installation, we might call it a building, you know? Killing what they would call enemy targets, but we might call them like brother, or maybe a father, or you know, relatives, a loved one, you know what I mean? We might also call a sanction a, a war. But it feels better about calling to call something a sanction, because you know, it's like, it feels very democratic of us. Very sterile. So I'm gonna read a cheerful poem now. Um, of course, I'm being facetious. <laughs> I would like to read a couple poems um, near the end that might be um, in a different vein completely, but I think this is important um, for a wide variety of reasons. Those of you who haven't been in the military, um, certain uniforms, there's three stripes. There's a sergeant, of, and a rocker of yellow hung below is like a staff sergeant in certain uh, parts of the military. This is called insignia, right? And um, it started from something I heard on the news which was astonishing to me, um, which is that one in three female soldiers um, will experience sexual assault while serving in the military. One in three. And there are also men who experience sexual assault in the military. A story that's just crushed and nobody seems to be talking about. There's, if you go to Palo Alto in, in California, the VA Medical Center has a branch there, they call it a campus, that serves only women who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan who uh, experienced sexual assault and is treating them there. But there's also a campus dedicated to men who serve in the same places also experience uh, sexual assault. So this poem is called the same <clears throat> She hides under a deuce and half this time, sleeping on a roll of foam draped in mosquito netting. Sand flies hover throughout the night. She sleeps under a vehicle exhaust and heat, dreaming of mortars buried beside her, three stripes painted on each cold tomb, a rocker of yellow hung below. It's you she's dreaming of, Sergeant. She'll dream of you for years to come if she makes it out of this country alive, which she probably will. You will be the fire and the hovering breath, not the sniper, not the bomber in the streets, you. And so I'm here to ask for this one night's reprieve. Let her sleep tonight, let her sleep. Pause a moment under the gibbous moon, smoke. The gin your wife sent from New Jersey, colored mint green with food dye disguised in a bottle of mouthwash, Take a long swig of it. Take the edge out of your knuckles. Let it blur your vision into a tremor of lights. The explosions in the distance are not your own. In these long hours before dawn on the banks of the Tigris River, let her sleep. In her dream, your eyes are pools of rifle oil. You unsheathe the bayonet from its scabbard while she waits. On a mattress of sand and foam, there in the motor pool, she waits to kiss bullets into your mouth. I've read that poem at all four service academies, Annapolis, West Point, the Air Force Academy, and the Coast Guard. I was actually in New London at the Coast Guard Academy just a couple weeks ago and read that poem. Because many of them, it's a privilege as a former NCO or sergeant, enlisted person, to be able to talk to the future officer corps and, and try to, in this sense, encourage them not to check the box when they do their sexual assault training to really be actively engaged in a conversation to protect the people around them, their family, from the sociopaths among us inside our communities that need to be um, dealt with. So um, I share that because in a college campus community, um, you may also need to band together and deal with those who you know, will, will do these unspeakable things to others and not let it be something that's just a conversation, a check the box kind of conversation. So, for what it's worth, it's uh, very, very heavy. I try to remember, I remember thinking in terms of the uniform, uh, being in Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, people, there are people actively hunting for your soul. I try to imagine my sister in a uniform 
She did. She wasn't in the military, but if she were, in some place like that where she's in an co active combat zone, people are trying to kill her, and yet when she's on the base, there may be usually among the. I was a sergeant, and so this is particularly uh, an affront to me because the sergeant's job is to take care of their soldiers. You know, that's their number one job, and the fact that the mostly sergeants were preying upon um, uh, other soldiers um, seems to me uh, uh, just a great. Just, I, I, I start to lose language, I have to return to the poem. Yeah. Okay, this, this poem is called It Leaves in Rain. <clears throat> I was walking through the middle of my life, walking down to Visadero Street wearing old desert combat fatigues, listening to the antifreeze boil over. I was listening to the antifreeze boil over in conversations on the street, that dead-end steaming hiss of radiators run 100,000 miles and more. The radiators boiled over in fatigue while I was walking 100,000 miles down to Visadero Street in Fresno. And it was July, and the asphalt was speaking its vapor, and I was wearing combat boots and walking to the middle of my life. I was listening to war. I was listening to war on the Visadero Street and learning how to ride low through the rest of my life, learning how to walk the blocks in tighter and tighter circles the way the lost do. In tighter and tighter circles, I was lost to the war on Divisadero Street. I was circling the war the way vapor curls from the steaming hiss of dead radiators in Fresno. I was circling the lost in Fresno, wearing my combat boots worn down 100,000 miles and counting. And I was counting. I counted each dying face passing by. I counted the birds with their exhausted voices. I counted the sentinel birds perched silent in the eucalyptus trees above. I circled the eucalyptus birds and listened for their medicine, the way the lost do in Fresno, wearing combat boots and speaking in vapor. I was circling to the middle of my life, right there under the medicine trees, listening to the silence of the sentinel birds and waiting for them to boil over and steam. But that's not what medicine birds do. Medicine birds break open in orange and red. Medicine birds have eucalyptus feathers for wings and, when they, ban and they bandage the air when they fly. Medicine birds fly through the windows in the head, impervious to glass. They are impervious to war and hiss and steam and vapor and combat and the circling lost. Medicine birds fly through the windows to land in our beds when we dream our circling dream of Divisadero and Fresno with its lost and circling war. Medicine birds have eucalyptus wings and when they fly in our beds they transform themselves into leaves and rain and lovers. The lovers in our beds are eucalyptus birds flying medicine through the windows in our heads. The lovers in our medicine beds fly eucalyptus through the circling loss. The lovers in our beds bring medicine to our lips, call it eucalyptus, call it love, call it leaves and rain for our exhausted souls. There's a lot of work welcoming you know, veterans coming home, and finding a way for them. Um, how many of you know someone, or maybe perhaps yourself, who's been in Iraq or Afghanistan, or has been in military service, and is there now, is going there? Those of you in front, if you look back, you can see in the community, right? a lot of people, you know, and maybe there'll be more hands raised in the future. Um, I think what I'll do, try to gauge when you all have to take off from here. <laughs> um, do you have some questions or anything like that, or is there something on your mind, insults, a shoe to throw at me or something, you know, some heckling, you know, good natured heckling, <laughs> but, but do you have, what's on your mind, you know, what, yeah. I want to know if you, like, learned any other languages, and if you, like, write poems in that language. Like I, like, I speak Spanish, too, and I'm learning Arabic, and so I try to write poems that, like, incorporate a little bit of Spanish into yeah. the English. Uh, right, right. Um, yeah, you, you might like um, Tomas Morin. He just did a <coughs> wonderful some translations of Neruda, um, so you might like to check those out. Um, I just got the book and been flipping through it. Um, and it has both uh, versions, you know, the Spanish for the original and in the English. Um, I, I've incorporated some Arabic phrases into some of the poems, um, but I'm, I found, and I've had struggled to try to learn Arabic. And, I'm learning and, too. Yeah, but what, if you go around and go, uh, if you go into YouTube and look around for different videos, you might find, I forget her name, but she's wonderful, and she has this, she has this big chalkboard, and it really helps me, because she uses this, I don't know where she bought it, but it has this massive marker that has a, the tip of it is like this wide, and so she can write in very large letters so you can see it very, very clearly rather than a fine pen where it's kind of hard to see. My dad, is his hobby is language. He loves languages. Um, so he's learning 
oddly is learning French right now. It seems very kind of conventional in some sense. But, you know, I remember calling him from Chicago one time. I always call on, I was calling my mom, I always call him on, on Valentine's Day to say, you know, and uh, he always answers the phone first. It's a weird tick he has. Who's there? You know, and, uh, and I'm like, hey, Dad, hey, what's going on? He's like, oh, I'm just brushing up on my tie. You know? And he doesn't, he doesn't know anybody who's from Thailand who speaks, you know. <laughs> He's just brushing up on it, you know, kind of thing. He, he was a Russian linguist uh, during the height of the Cold War in the mid-60s, and so he used to fly over Russian airspace, and the MiGs would come after them, and if they were killed, there would be a training accident back home. It wouldn't be reported the way, you know. So, um, and, there was some, and then his brother was in Vietnam as a Vietnamese linguist. Um, the other one played tuba in Japan for the army band. <laughs> but, I, but yeah, I, uh, let me ask you something, because um, offer this question, because I think this is intriguing and maybe important. How many of you in Arabic, um, except yourself, how many of you know how to say the word friend in Arabic? How many of you know how to say hello? How many of you know how to say goodbye? He probably, if he doesn't know how to say hello, he probably know how to say goodbye. Or least the um, how many of you know how to say, like, say, um, uh, bread or water? Or I, I guess what I'm asking, and this is a question I ask myself, and I'm just sharing it with you. So if you feel indicted in some way, I think that's good, actually. But um, but know that I'm sharing it from an indictment I've already found in myself, and I'm sharing it with you. you know? How long have we been fighting in a part of the world that speaks Arabic? We don't even know how to say friend, or hello, or goodbye, much less the conversation between those two words. Do we give a shit about the things we do in this world? We're talking about 1.2 million, we take the lowest ballpark figure, say 30,000 people. If we're a nation that can bury 30,000 people or 1.2 million people in the earth, cover them over with sand, take the last breath of their life, know nothing about them. What does that say about us as a nation? It tells me we have a lot of work to do because the historians all have it wrong. Open up history. I love history books. I, when I was seven, before I wanted to be a baseball player, the very first job I ever wanted to be was an historian. It's a pretty odd start in life, but I wanted to be a historian. And then um, I remember opening up, uh, and you do it to this day, you open up a book. My grandfather was in World War II, right? If you open up an American textbook on in history, what, you usually put them in parentheses, just like they do on the tombstones in the cemetery, pointing that way, like this. Is there a cemetery that way? Right. <laughs> I wonder if I have some like lightning rod pull over to the cemetery, you know, so whatever, you know. Any cemetery you can go to, pretty much, you see the birth and the death, and they usually put in parentheses, just like they do wars in history books. So for World War II, what are the usual dates that you might come across? Or you're not going to get an A or an F for this. What's that? 41 and 45. 41 45, right? Some countries might say 39 and 45, but right? most Americans say 41 to 45. Although a lot of those other countries will say, you guys didn't show up until like 42 to 43. Yeah, really, yeah. you know, you know, you know, the argument. But um, yeah, 1941 to 45, you see that commonly. Um, Korea, you might see 50, 53, something like that, right? Um, Vietnam has a sort of a little fuzzier. Um, these wars will have a similar thing. We have a president that I voted for twice, right? And um, I'm glad I did so. But there are things I disagree with him. And when I hear something like, oh, we finished this war and bring the troops back home. Like the Marines just finished in Afghanistan, right? Wasn't that on the news like two days ago or something? Or a couple of days, last week or something? But it's done, war's over, Marines coming home, you know? But I can tell you that all of the historians have it wrong. You know? Go to Fresno today, my grandpa is still there. Spend a day with him. At some point during the day, you will you might not say it aloud, but somewhere in your mind, but oh, I'm in the presence of World War II. There it is right there. Beaches of Guam. First wave on the beach of Guam. Or if you stayed, if you stayed at night, you might watch him take the pills that he just got a couple of years ago that helped him sleep. Before he had those pills, he would always scream in his sleep at night. And we were always told that he was fighting the Indians which was a euphemism kind of thing from the 1970s television, when all, all the time in the 70s there were these sort of, there were what we call euphemistically Westerns, and nations in America, what is now called America, nations were wiped out, you know, and uh, the westward expansion. So, but that was on television, we, so we understood, oh, yeah, he's fighting against the Indians. So, what I'm saying is, is that for the rest of your life, if you're born in 94, 96, 
You know, you weren't voting. You weren't like, hey, yeah, let's go to Afghanistan. Let's or no, let's don't. Whatever you weren't, whatever you, however you feel on these things, you didn't have a voice in it. You know, and you're inheriting a lot of weight. What are you going to do with it? And that's my question. What are you going to do with it? Uh, should I read a, maybe a short poem? And uh, is time how many? Five minutes. Okay. Let me read a poem that's. Uh, let me read a poem. That's, just completely different subject. If you could, just for a second, we'll just wipe the slate clean. And this is sort of a goodbye poem, because I'm, I'm going to take off. And who knows if our lives will pass again in the future? You know, I hope they do. I hope you call me, and I'll, these are pretty short sleeves, but I'll roll up my sleeves and help you out with your good project to help you know, um, people in the future. Because hopefully, you will do something you know, to create bridges uh, with people. And I'll, I'll say one quick short story. I sat 2012 and went back for National Geographic, did a story, don't read it, it's boring. But um, I did, I sat in a courtyard in Baghdad with um, Sadek Mohammed. He was talking about T.S. Eliot and Edith Sitwell, who never gets credit, and how they came through. The British were there in the northern part of Iraq, 1918 to 1925. And they had a, what they called a protectorate, troops on the ground, you know. And they brought a British citizen into Baghdad, opened a bookstore. T.S. Eliot, Edith Sitwell came through there, part of the salon culture of the day, shifted. Uh, part of it was part of the spark of the free verse movement in the Arabic world. For those of you who are writers, hopefully that's interesting. But the main point he was making was he said, you know, when the British came before, they brought their boots and tanks. Where's the other part? You brought your helicopters and guns and cruise missiles, but like, where's the other part? And you don't have to learn Arabic to talk to many of these people. You know, you can talk to them through Skype if you're too afraid to go there, which would make sense. You know, you can email them. And, the, and when I say they speak English, this is a direct quote when, of Sadek Muhammad telling me in Baghdad, talking about TSL. He said, he's a big guy, he said, well, with Elliot, well, where is the objective correlative? I ask you. <laughs> That's a direct quote. With Elliot, where is the objective correlative? I ask you. What is the objective correlative? You guys know? You can have a conversation with a lot of fuel in it. You know, something that's very intriguing. And you don't have to learn Arabic to do it. And there, his point was, where's the other part? When are you people going to start talking to us, with us, with us, not to us? I should say with us. Yeah. So, quick poem. Circumnavigating the globe. And just so you know, sailing, a sailing ship back in the day would carry two of these uh, side lights between sunset and sunrise. One green to starboard, one red to port. In 1819, she held the scrimshaw carving from a whale's tooth as the Essex pulled anchor and set out from Nantucket, her lover on the foot ropes leading to the crow's nest, waving goodbye. He would never be seen alive again, something she somehow knew, her hands trembling with what love can do within us, only beginning to learn what it can do as years pass by. She said, I love you, just as the Essex disappeared from sight. And the words carried on the wind, in the earth's turning, rising and falling in a duet with the ocean's blue waters. Her words rose in thermal updrafts. They fell with the rain, wandering through long decades, through the streets of Tangier, Port Mosby, Panama City, to round the Cape of Good Hope, Drake's Passage. Her own skeleton long underground, and yet her words continue on to the apple orchards, the gold sway of wheat on the prairie, Indian summer grass rusting into another England, autumn in New England where they finally discover an old man on his deathbed, late in the 20th century, dying in a hospital where no one gives a damn and he knows it, knowing also that he deserves nothing more. And yet, these words, he hears them in the breeze at the window, the curtains lifting and falling as they near, and they pass right by him, a sweet thing, that, even if they were never meant for him. Here they are, called out over the sea, one voice of the eternal, love, even as it escapes us, even as we set sail with the side lights on, red to port, green to starboard, never to return. I wish you well, and I hope you have a Thank you very much for having me.